but what we um, we sort of talk about as a community is that we we have, you know we have the ice obligate species that um, because they're so dependent upon the ice, the polar bear, the walrus, the bearded seal, ring seal, um, we expect that they're going to be um, impacted the most. Then we have the ice associated species <coughs> that we know uh, sort of with the ice, but maybe they can. What will happen when there isn't ice? And then there are these seasonally migrant species like the fin whale, minkies, humpback, greys and killer whales that maybe they're going to be more common up here. And we've actually heard the last couple of days from folks about observations of killer whales in um, Kotzebu Sound and killer whales um, taking grey whale calves and, and eating tongues up here, which is a, in my area, Monterey Bay, is an annual occurrence. We have a transient population of killer whales that come into Monterey Bay every February for the grey whale migration and they take grey whale calves, they eat the tongues and the um, calf carcasses wash up. So it's it's what killer whales know how to do and um, it's interesting to hear this is a new observation here and I thought, oh, there's one thing that I actually know about, you know, if I see a dead grey whale calf without a tongue, um, those are um, typically grey whale kills, uh, killer whale kills in, in the Monterey Bay area. Can I comment? Sure, do do. Grey whales have been coming up here for a long time. Killer whales have been coming up to Bear Sea for a long time. And this is not new. Killer whales come up here annually. Mm -hmm. uh, they come up after the ice uh, generally is gone from the Bering Sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, same way with the uh, same way with the uh, uh, grey whale. They're first here. They're, they're already it's not a new thing. Um, point I'm trying to make is that killer whales have come up here for ever since there's been o in an ocean with sea mammals in it. Mm -hmm. The people in Kotzebue thought it was a new thing to live in their area. So there are differences mm -hmm. between areas. Mm -hmm. so this is what we heard in Kotzebue mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they they were <laughs> recording. They had put recorders out to to listen for beluga, and they were trying to see when the beluga arrived and instead of getting beluga sounds they were recording killer whale sounds but if so that's not unusual not new okay well i'm from further south in stevens from tiny mortal where they've been they've been seeing the uh, killer whales come in and uh, we don't have the big whales down there, but we have balugas. Mm -hmm. And we know when the schools come in, right behind them, we see the killer whales. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we show a lot of respect for that animal. We, mm -hmm. don't, mm -hmm. we don't try to go after it, we just leave it. Mm -hmm. its, job is, its job is to let us know it's there. And mm -hmm. We appreciate the, them coming because they're cleaning the oceans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's nothing new from south. That's the south. south no. So do you think, is it possible that they didn't go as far as Kotzebue, or I have no idea what they're doing Kotzebue. They go all the way. Okay, it's good. They go all the way. Okay. In the 60s, they, they were in barrels. Yeah. They feed on all the sea mammals. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Kotzebue might be air, new to their uh, the pool of uh, Kilowog because it's kind of a sound, and most of the whales and stuff probably just pass through, go up north to Bear or area. But like uh, he said, it's not new to our area. I see mm -hmm. whales right at the tip of the peninsula. There. So it may be more the sound yeah, that's the unusual, as distinct from the the, the latitude, or mm -hmm. so, yeah. But we've been seeing that mm -hmm. since I know mm -hmm. my parents mm -hmm. before them. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not new to our area, mm -hmm. probably new to Katsubi some because as it warms up, they're going into those inlets and the bays. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good to get that straight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, shipping, um, <coughs> shipping, uh, there are lots of again, you can go on the web and find great maps of how shipping is increasing usually sort of on these major routes across the oceans um, and these maps are generated by putting together um, automatic uh, the AIS system where ships have to have a, a system of, of, of being tracked um, so that so typically you know over the past 
50 years, most of that activity has been sort of round the, um, in the, in the uh, mid middle belt, if you like. And here we have these, the, the new routes opening up. So um, rather than, again, tell you about your own backyard, um, this is my backyard. Uh, this is a blue whale on the beach just outside San Francisco where I live. So that's myself and my husband having our Sunday morning walk. And here is this massive blue whale and it's clearly hit by propellers. Um, and it also has great, these are um, great white shark bites um, along the back. So this is becoming a um, more frequent uh, um, observation in, in our, our area. Um, we also often get um, fin whales that um, when the ship comes into port, and it's only when they come into port and um, they release the ballast water and the bow comes up and then they find the dead whale across it. So um, most of these occasions they never knew they hit the whale until they come into port. Um, so sometimes they can go back and they can check the, the record and they find that there was a slight dip in speed at some point. Um, but really most often they never knew they even did it. So, um, so uh, there seems to be two ways the whales are hit. One is, is the bow and the other is through prop injuries from the, from the back end of the, of the ship. And so that's something to think about when we're thinking about how to prevent this from happening because the bow is actually, the ones that are hit by the prop is, is one thing, that's a big noisy um, area, but the quietest place um, or most protected from noise from the, from the propeller is actually just in front of the bow. So there have been efforts to try and produce sound from the front of the ship through pingers or acoustic devices so that there is sound projected in front of the vessel um, rather than ha that being a very silent area. And um, many of these occasions when I've been to the port to collect samples from the whale, I mean the captain does not want to hit whales. These guys do not want to hit whales. It's just they don't know they're there and, and um, it happens. So um, referring to this AIS ship tracking, what um, uh, these are data, I'm going to talk about California because it's an area that I know, but there's a very similar exercise happening on the east coast around DC, as I mentioned, for the northern right whales. But we can um, find out where the ships are, and these are the tracks on the top, and then you can go out in a small vessel and observe the blue whales, and these are blue whale sightings on the bottom, um, collected by um, a research group, Cascadia Research Group, and uh, um, John Kalambakidis is the, a really active researcher within that group. And basically what he can show us is that here we have the Channel Islands and this is, this is a shipping route that goes straight into the port of Long Beach and LA, so one of the busiest ports um, in the United States. And the, the whales are actually feeding on krill associated with upwelling um, right across the shipping lane. So, so we have a problem. So what are we going to do? We have these whales feeding in the shipping lane. Um, and at first, uh, there, there was a, um, an idea, well, we'll just move the shipping lane. We can just put them in a different place. But how will the whales, how do the whales actually respond to the ships? And what, are the, um, what do they do when they hear a ship coming? Um, so there's different ways to get at this. So the first thing, and this is actually some work done by David Laced, who was also on the staff at the Railway Commission, was he looked at the, the data from... Um, uh, ship, ships that had hit whales but actually had a, had a <coughs> recorded when they did it and they knew the speed they were going at. And if we look at the number of um, whales that were actually killed by, by the ship, those are ones in red, and then we can look at whales that only had a minor injury, so the ship reported hitting the whale but the whale then swam away. Um, and the bottom here is the ship <coughs> speed in knots. And so what you can see is um, if, a, if a ship is going under 10 knots, the whale is usually hit but doesn't or it doesn't die. Whereas once you get over 10 knots, um, the whales are pretty consistently um, killed. So obviously one way to, to reduce mortality of whales from ships is to reduce shipping speeds. But you can't do that globally and, and these guys have a business to do and they need to get into port. So, so that's one option, is reducing ship speed, and it could be done at certain times in certain places. Um, but John Kalambakidis, who I mentioned earlier, um, he 
he was a little concerned about this idea as being a little simplistic because he felt that you could reduce ship speed but it may mean that the ship is now in the shipping lane for longer so there's more time for it to be close to the whale so are you actually really always going to be um, reducing the risk of ship speed so John's a little little bit of a wild man so he's been going out in a in a small skiff and he's been getting in the shipping lanes outside San Francisco and, and Los Angeles and he goes around in front of these big container ships and that little vessel and then when he finds a blue whale he's been darting them and applying a tag that's a suction top cap so it kind of sticks onto the whale a bit like those um, stickies that stick on the tiles in the bathroom and that tag can record the depth the whale is going and its movement um, and then the location of the whale so here he is leaning over a blue whale and at the time he's actually in front of a container ship so um, it's not the easiest thing to do um, and then so this is these are data from two blue whales he managed to tag right in front of a, of a ship so there's the tag going onto the whale um, and then these are a whole set of different types of data that he can get then get from that tag and he can see what the whale's doing and then record what it does when um, when the whale when the ship goes past um, so these are two different ships um, two different sh um, big container ships two different whales and what they were doing and I think we can go in closer here and this is a little hard to see but this is the top here is the typical whale dive and up at the top you can see when the ship um, comes by the whale actually stops its deep dive and it just does a little shallow dive and comes back to the surface and um, he's got multiple recordings like this and if you put them all together what he's found is that when the ships come by the whales actually don't do their deep dive and they spend more time at the surface because they're basically spooked by this noise so what that does is it puts the whale right in front of the ship if it did its deep dive it would be fine but it's not doing it because it's it's afraid so this then means that they're spending more time at the surface so there's more time for contact with the ship so he actually feels that probably in the situation of these particular blue whales the faster the ship gets out of there the better because it's going to come past and the whale's going to dive so there's some complexities that um that the more science you do the more complicated it gets so in the Bering Strait we have shallow water would that make a difference has he done his cups Pro probably he's only done i mean this is, hard, this is hard to do he's just done this in the um shipping channel coming into the golden gate so it's a dr deep. it's it's deep it's uh -huh. dredged and it's deep i can't read your uh, depth but it's um they're diving to 250 meters oh yeah that's way <laughs> deeper than we have so yeah interesting thank you and, and i'm sure the whales are going to behave completely differently in different depths of waters so um the point really is that generalizing is we can't generalize as as always um, so some of the things that, that have been happening um, in, the, in the lower 48 to try and reduce the risk to ships are uh, sometimes there are voluntary um, regulations put in place and, and what's happened in California is essentially just a, a warning to mariners um, and the idea there was to, to just basically these guys don't want to hit ships so saying this is where the whales are and coming into San Francisco we have three approach lanes so if there's a, a warning to mariners about the location of the whales they can then select which um, which lane to use and what has happened there is they mostly have not been able to select a lane on the approach to San Francisco because their timing is is um, governed by the union hours at the port when they need to un un unload so and despite regulations, despite where the whales are, despite not wanting to hit whales, they need to get into port to unload these containers at the beginning of the shift. So it's actually driven by the unions. But they were completely willing to take any lane going out and to cut their speed. So by, by um, having a, a conversation and, and, um, and working together, the community basically came up with well how about we can't do anything on the way in but if you'll agree on the way out to drop your speed and and choose a lane where whales aren't that's already reduced the risk 50 percent which is which is a lot and that's completely voluntary so you can do a lot with um, understanding what their concerns are and also what the what the whales are doing